Our third presentation is Seeing is Believing, Electron Microscopy and the Art of DNA Sushi. This cube involves faculty from the medical school and the Department of Chemistry in LSNA, plus a faculty member and postdoctoral fellow from the Life Sciences Institute. Representing the team now is Professor Nils Walter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today and talk to you about our work. Uh, I should emphasize, however, that this is really a teamwork between my colleagues, Yorgo uh, from LSI and Biochemistry, as well as Roger Sunahara from Pharmacology, and particularly the two postdocs, Lena and Soma, as well as the grad student, Jake, that are involved in this project and really do all the hard work. So it's really a pleasure and a privilege, privilege for me to be here today. So as Valerie pointed out, I'm going to tell you about um, how we can see to believe and how in particular electron microscopy, a very big, very expensive microscope, allows us to see very, very tiny what we jokingly call DNA sushi. Now first, however, I want to introduce you to the idea of self-assembly, which we will theme throughout my talk. Self-assembly is the idea that you can assemble by itself various part particles into a very well-defined structure. This is a high school type experiment that you see here executed with bottle caps that have different magnets in them. The white ones repel each other, the green ones repel each other, but the white and the green ones attract. And as you can see, if you steer this a little bit with a ruler, um, they are floating in water, they can move about. Over time, they assemble into various different structures, and at some point, they even form perhaps something that looks a little bit like a cube, as you see here, just based on the rule that the green and the white want to be close to one another. Uh, and then later, a rectangle starts forming. And then perhaps with a little bit more steering and a little bit of an error correction that becomes necessary at some point, you will get even something like um, a square, basically a flat cube. Right? And so in this way, you can... <laughs> You can make various structures by self-assembly. It happens on its own based on a few rules. And of course, uh, in a other situation, for example, people in a powwow, they can also self-assemble into a structure like concentric rings here, rings of uh, groups of people that form rings by simple rules that tell them to hold hands to one another and then form a circle. And then if multiple circles form, they form rings around one another in this type of self-assembly based on these rule, uh, uh, rules and a little bit of energy put into the system. And you could argue that, of course, that happens at all length scales with people of all kinds. So it happened also with Roger, Yorgo, and myself, who through some random process and some steering uh, eventually came together, and as you know, out of this grew a cube. <laughs> now, the molecule in our bodies that can do this the best and has the best rules that we know of is, of course, DNA. DNA encodes all the genetic information that we have. That is the blueprint for how to make a human body. And as you can see, that's based on relatively simple recognition, relatively simple rules, where these four uh, building blocks called T, A, C, and G come together pairwise where T and A and C and G form pairs. And these pairs form together to form a gene and then come together to form many more genes to form a whole genome that makes us humans. And um, in addition to these rules of pairings, there are additional rules that are necessary to fold this structure into a small enough entity to fit into each of your cells. Just to give you a sense, this, the DNA that we have in our genomes is about a meter long, and it has to fold into a very compact structure that fits into the micrometer, one micrometer, which is one hundred thousandths of, uh, or about a hundred hundreds of the uh, breadth of a hair of the nucleus of a cell. And you have a hundred trillion cells that each contain a full meter of DNA uh, as the blueprint. So this happens by this DNA forming, folding into a structure that we call a chromosome that forms by self-assembly to fit into this very tiny, tiny structure of the cell. Now the question then is, can we use a molecule like DNA to fold something that, by our design? Can we engineer this to fold something that we want? For example, a basket, as you see here, or a mat, like you see from this bamboo pieces come together and of course, we would like to do have that happen by itself, by self-assembly, by a set of rules where we just mix things together and they fold just as we want. Is that possible? 
And the nice thing about DNA is it does exactly that. We can lake, take a long strand of DNA, and we take 200 small strands of DNA, pieces of DNA, and they all come together magically, like only DNA can, into a structure by our design, by choosing the particular pairings that these A, T, and G, C um, are making. And as you can see from this animation, uh, a DNA could, for example, form a rectangle, a mat that we can put something on. Now, this mat, I should say, is only about 100 nanometers long. It's on the nanometer scale. What's a nanometer? It's a thousandth of the breadth, a hundred thousandth of the breadth, actually, of a hair. It's really tiny. So how can we actually see that? How can we know that we've self-assembled something that we want? In order to do that, we need a big, big microscope. You see here on the left a $3 million electron microscope that we have here on campus that uh, allows us to look at really tiny, tiny structures. And the way it works is basically like with the very old um, TV tubes that you might, some of you might recall, certainly I do, um, where you have an electron gun that shoots electrons at a screen that is fluorescent and gives you a picture, kind of like this. In the electron microscope, unlike the TV tube, however, you have a so-called specimen, a sample, in between the um, electron gun and the screen. And by shooting the electrons through that sample, some of these electrons will be absorbed, will be taken away, will be moved away, and you will get essentially a shadow imprinted on that vacuum, uh, on that, sorry, fluorescent screen on the bottom by way of the electrons moving through that sample and hitting some resistance. Now with that, we can really see very, very tiny structures. And uh, if you recall, we have these rectangular origami, DNA origami as we call them. We can fold. Um, they are very small. They have a little handle as you see them here. And we can put them into our electron microscope and we can see structures appear, um, maybe, okay. um, that are very small. And uh, again, they are just 100 nanometers long overall, as you see from the scale bar, which is about a thousandth of the breadth of a hair. So they're really tiny, but we can, with these electron microscopes, really see individual ones. And you can also tell that obviously this is a noisy image. You can see that there are some rectangular structures behind in the gray background there, but they're kind of hard to discern. So how can we see them a little better, perhaps? In order to do that, we do the same thing what you would do with a bad image from one of these old TV uh, tubes, um, where basically the image is very noisy, as you see here in the left upper corner. But if you take a second image and overlay that with the first one, we start seeing a, f uh, a figure appearing, a portrait appearing. And if you put more and more over there and average, if you get a crisper and crisper image like you see here, and eventually you see actually who this is. Um, the person says averaging rules. Never mind that this is, of course, uh, the British rule we've gotten rid of many years ago, uh, British Queen shown here. Um, but you can imagine that by this averaging, you can get a better picture. And so we do the same thing with our pictures, electron microscope pictures of our origami that we folded together. And lo and behold, you can suddenly see this very intricate weaving of the DNA, the structure that puts this together by self-assembly into a rectangle like this. Now, what can we use these rectangular structures for? Well, we really want to use them as a platform, as a plate, if you wish, to put something on. And we can do that by using anchors that you see here in the purple. And we can anchor to these anchors uh, an additional molecule like this, and many molecules that attach to this. And, um, and with that, we can immobilize, we can put down on that um, platform protein molecules that we're interested to study. Okay? And so um, in this way, you can see here the raw image of the electron microscraft. Uh, you see various different proteins now in lighter spots assembled on these origami. And you can see that they have a very regular um, structure, relatively regular um, disposition on that origami uh, platform on this mat here um, because we've put them there in defined spots that we can choose by design. Now, the type of molecules, the type of proteins that we're actually interested in studying are found in the human cell. They are actually sitting in the membrane, that's the envelope of the cell, and they sit there as so-called signaling receptors to wait for signals from the outside and give the cell a cue what's going on on the outside. So if a signal comes in, which could be uh, light, photon, could be an electrical impulse, could be smell, right? Then they give a signal to the interior of the cell to tell the cell, okay, something's happening and what exactly is happening. 
These signaling receptors, therefore, are very important. For example, they control the heart rate because that's electrical impulses that they signal and receive. Or they can, uh, of course, organize brain activity. For example, of a football player, the quarterback thinking about the next move, where to throw uh, the football. Of course, our current team needs some help with that. Right? <laughs> now, about these signaling receptors, we know quite a bit. Last year, um, or actually this year, the Nobel Prize was given, no, last year was the Nobel Prize was given for physiology or medicine um, for the discovery, and we know a lo whole lot about how they work. We can zoom in on them. There's um, a lot of information on them. They are embedded in membranes, as you see here, and they undergo changes in shape um, as the signaling event occurs. But how can we study this in more detail using our origami? In order to do that, we package these into a membrane themselves. You can put a membrane into a spheroidal protein that you see there in green and put these membrane components called phospholipids in there and then we can insert a protein, one of these signaling receptors in there and we have a molecular sushi, if you wish. And now we can do an take an electron micrograph of such a sushi uh, that you see here and then we can put them down onto our origami platform or a mattress here and hold the, onto them and take an electron micrograph and you see these individual spots on there again at the nanometer scale. Now with that we have really started assembling something by self-assembly from small to larger. You, we started out with our DNA mattress, our origami that we can image and we can get a CRISPR image on. We can put proteins on there and this really resembles like the Ford company uh, has um, a uh, factory uh, assembly line or so, but in contrast to Ford, we don't need robots to do this. It all happens by putting things together in self-assembly, stirring the pot a little bit, and then magically a structure appears that we have designed. So you can imagine that in the future we can put, for example, more complex uh, sushi on our mattress, on our plate, right? and put them in different arrangements by self-assembly and have them execute different interactions with one another and do fa fancy things where ultimately they might be able to, um, might be able to organize some uh, higher uh, information processing um, and ultimately, for example, could uh, replace the lost smell of a patient or um, help an Alzheimer's patient perhaps um, recover um, the signaling in his brain. Um, and I think sometimes um, our football players might need some help with that as well. So with that, um, we have assembled the cube by self-assembly, and I hope you learned a little bit about how that would work at the molecular scale.